do so afterwards, but you can fill it out now if you want to. Uh, the presentation you're about to hear is from John Hayden. This is a, uh, a topic that, you know, it we, we seems like the diocese has uh, been involved with for the last few months. And John is here to help us completely under, or to understand better exactly what our policies are in regard to sexual misconduct and, and, and related topics. So if you would please give him your attention, which I'm sure you will. But remember to turn those slips in afterwards. We do keep, we, we, as a matter of record, we keep, uh, we will make sure that everybody in the schools uh, have viewed this presentation one way or the other. So to get an accurate count, we need to make sure you turn your slips in today to your principals. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I know many, many of you out there from um, uh, working with you all uh, over the years. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, Dan and the school office has asked me to talk uh, a little bit about uh, diocesan policies. Um, particularly in terms of the policy regarding sexual misconduct, and I want to touch on a few other things. This is not a comprehensive policy review. You all have copies of the, the school administrative manual in your offices or in the principal or director's office where you all work, and, and um, you know, there are lots of policies. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're just going to talk about a few of them today. Um, we are not set up to take questions during this presentation. But afterwards, I'll hang around, and if you've got any questions, come up and see me. I also want to introduce Becky McGinnis, my partner um, at Length of Engage. Becky works with, has worked with a lot of you on employment issues, um, and so she's, I asked her to be here so she can answer some questions or, or, or be available if you want to talk to her after the presentation's over. And then... Um, Somebody else I'll be introducing during uh, the course of my presentation is Jennifer Valenti. Jennifer, if you'd stand up. She's the new ombudsman slash public liaison uh, for the diocese um, for uh, taking reports of misconduct. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the diocesan policy regarding sexual misconduct. This is a diocesan policy. It's on the diocese website. It's not limited to schools. It's for all diocesan institutions, parishes, um, as well as schools and other institutions. Um, again, it's available on the website if you want to find it. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of the policy. The primary scope of this policy is uh, sexual abuse of a minor by a priest or a deacon. That is the primary scope of this particular policy. Um, and and it's, it's got procedures for how the diocese handles those kind of reports. But in addition to the primary scope, the, uh, the, the people that are responsible for implementing this policy, uh, in particular the response team and the independent review board, uh, may also uh, accept reports regarding any other claim of misconduct, let me change that there, any other claim of misconduct by clergy or a diocesan officer or any claim of sexual abuse of a minor by an employee or a volunteer. So when you look at the primary scope and the supplemental scope, it, it, it covers just about anything. Um, and so we need to be familiar with this. As, as you know, um, you know, certain People in the diocese have taken some criticism lately for um, not following through necessarily on the uh, scope of our own policy, and that's why it's important that we understand what our policy is and that we act upon it. Assistance to those affected is a primary scope of this policy. It's not just about reporting. It's about offering assistance to people who are affected by misconduct. And the two principal people who are in charge of that are our diocesan victim advocate, who is Leslie Gallat, and uh, Jennifer Valenti, who's our new ombudsman. Um, Jennifer um, graduated from MU, uh, both undergraduate and law school. Uh, she spent her professional career as a lawyer as part of the Jackson County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. 
uh, for five years. Um, she was awarded the Prosecuting Attorney of the Year uh, and the Victim Champion of the Year. She's very used to working with victims and in victim assistance. She was a team leader of the Domestic Violence Project. Uh, she's worked closely in her career with police, victims, witnesses, and various members of the community uh, at large with handling crimes um, involving victims. Um, she's um, a very, very open person and is excited to be here. And actually, I'd just like her to come up and say a few words so you all get to know who she is. First of all, I'd like to say I want you to know that I have a tremendous amount of admiration and respect for everybody in this room for several reasons. One of the reasons is because I was raised in a family of educators. My father was a teacher for 28 years. Another reason is because I myself am a product of Catholic education and I credit that for my success both professionally and spiritually. And the third reason, and I'm not sure if I can say this, is because I, my kids are part of this school district, my awesome and perfect kids. <laughs> I don't think I see a teacher. Oh, I see one back there. Um, and so I am really excited to be in this position. I have the privilege and the honor and the responsibility of investigating these cases. And the way that I will ensure that it is done in a professional manner, like I see every day at the school that my kids go to, is to make sure these cases are handled consistently and Every case is handled fully and fairly, and that's what I intend to do. Thank you. Right, she gets all the love. What's that about? <laughs> Again, Jennifer and Becky and I are going to hang around up here after this presentation, and uh, anybody that wants to come up and say hello or have a question for any of us, please feel free to do so. I know everybody's busy, but uh, we'll be around. So the review process, uh, you know, what happens when a report is made? Part of our process in the diocese for handling these claims is the response team. And that's, the response team is the team that meets with reporters of abuse or misconduct, that investigates and reports to the independent review board. Now under the new procedure with, with Jennifer's new role as the ombudsman, she is taking primary responsibility for the investigation uh, aspect and working with the other members of the response team um, as resources um, for what she needs. Uh, currently, the response team, and this information is all available on the website again, Leslie Glott, the victim's advocate, Margaret Lima, Paul Roeder, uh, Father Powers, who's the new vicar for clergy, and Jennifer serve as ex officio members of the response team. Um, the other board that uh, is important in our process is the independent review board. And this is a board that is reported, is appointed by the bishop. It includes uh, anywhere between six to nine members at any given time uh, under the, um, uh, the Dallas Charter, which is a, the charter that was adopted by the United States Conference for Catholic Bishops in 2002 by all the bishops in the United States. Um, it has uh, certain minimum requirements for the constitution of these independent review boards. And it has to include at least one non-Catholic, one pastor with uh, experience, and one mental health professional. Uh, all other persons are either lay persons or non-Catholic ministers. Um, and this board is independent. It is, uh, does not operate, you know, uh, under the auspices of the bishop or the vicar for clergy or the vicar general or anybody else. It is an independent board. Uh, the role of the board is to make recommendations to the bishop with respect to reports of misconduct, including the continued ministry of any accused clergy. Um, occasionally, the board will also be asked by uh, religious orders to look at claims involving uh, clergy members of various religious orders, uh, particularly smaller religious orders that don't have their own independent review boards. Currently, the independent review board is uh, composed of the following people. James Kakamo is the uh, president, Daniel House, John Larson, PhD, 
uh, Rick Smith, Father Robert Stewart, Gene Tatacoro, and then Father Party Powers, and again, Jennifer serve as ex officio members um, to that board. That is a very brief overview of the uh, diocesan sexual misconduct policy. Um, there's a lot more to it, but uh, you just need to be aware that we have to follow it in every instance. Another topic I want to talk about today briefly is mandatory reporting of child abuse or neglect in Missouri. Um, this uh, is covered in the Diocesan Administrative Manual, uh, but uh, I wanted to cover it here. Um, there's a definition in the statute, and this is all based on the Missouri statute. Uh, what is a mandatory reporter? Who are mandatory reporters? Uh, they include, and it's a long list, but for our purposes, um, with this group, it includes any basically anybody who's responsible for the care of children, daycare center workers, other child care workers, teachers, principals, other school officials, ministers or clergy who are responsible for children who are, or who supervise those responsible for children or anybody else who's responsible for kids. Okay, what are the circumstances requiring a report to the Division of Family Services? Two circumstances. The first is reasonable cause to suspect that a child has been, has been or may be subjected to abuse or neglect. That's circumstance number one. The second circumstance is if any mandatory reporter observes a child being subjected to circumstances which would reasonably result in abuse or neglect. What's abuse under the statute? Abuse is any physical injury, sexual abuse, or emotional abuse inflicted on a child other than by accidental means, and it specifically under the statute excludes disciplines such as spanking. Neglect is the failure to provide proper necessary support, education, nutrition, or health care necessary for a child's well-being. And again, we do have a reporting procedure um, to follow Missouri law that's set out in the Diocesan School Office Manual, section 400.41. Um, it's very clear. I know all of you are, are familiar with it. The first step is to immediately report to the principal, director, or other supervisor if you have a reasonable suspicion or if you observe conduct that would reasonably lead to suspect that a child has been subjected to abuse or neglect. The second step is that the principal or director immediately reports it to the superintendent who will assist the principal and director if there is any question as to whether a DFS report is mandated under those particular circumstances. The third step, if a report is mandated, the principal or director will call the DFS hotline number. And I'll go back one, one second here. What, what the, the statute says, a mandatory reporter is required to make sure that a, a report is filed. It, it doesn't require that the mandatory reporter is the person who actually makes the call. So as long as, if you're a teacher or a staff person and you follow the diocesan policy and report to the principal or director, they follow up with the superintendent. If it's a mandatory report situation, the principal or director makes the hotline call and keeps the, the original reporter in the loop. That satisfies the teacher or staff's statutory obligation to make sure that a report is filed. It's not a personal obligation, it's an obligation to make sure that a report is filed. Number four, um, a principal, director, teacher, or staff may make a DFS report even if it's not mandated. There's a whole section in the statute that says that the DFS will accept non-mandated reports and will follow up as they deem appropriate. So, you know, even if you think that under the circumstances 
A DFS report is not necessarily mandated. Uh, you should still follow up with your uh, uh, principal or director and um, come to a decision on what the appropriate course of conduct is under those circumstances, even if a mandatory report is not required. The principal or director will make sure and arrange for the full cooperation of all school staff with the diocesan school office and with the Division of Family Service in investigating any such report. And, you know, we just have to be committed to doing this. These are our kids. They're our responsibility. Um, that's what we've dedicated, you know, our lives and our careers for, and we've got to protect them when they're under our care. A third thing I wanted to touch on very briefly, very briefly as you will see, is employee screening and background checks. Uh, we have to do these. You know, we get occasional calls into the school office. Um, we find out that, you know, somebody's been hired and, you know, perhaps there's a question as to whether they should have been because of some, something that's shown up on a background check. All I'm gonna say is the Dyson School Office Manual uh, series 270 uh, addresses what you need to do for employee screening and background checks and it has all sorts of forms to enable you to do that. Please be familiar with those and follow those. Along the same lines, Virtus training. Please keep current on your updates. Um, I know it can be a pain. You know, you get these emails and you're supposed, you know, you have, to, you have to follow up. That training is not good for anybody unless we keep up on it, we keep up on the updates and uh, keep current on everything. Um, because we've made a commitment, you know, as an institution to do that. Um, so you can't just say, hey, you know, I went to uh, the Protecting God's Children program the first time. That's all I need to do. I don't have time to read all these emails. I know what they're going to say. Um, blah, 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 blah. You have to keep current on your training. All right. One other issue I wanted to talk about that's, that's come up pretty recently. Um, even more so than usual is guidelines for use of social networks. Um, the diocese has had a policy on this. They are in the process of revising it. Uh, I expect that uh, the bishop is going to approve it probably by the end of this month. Um, but for right now, the, the, the policy is under revision, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, Guidelines for employees. And everybody knows what I'm talking about with social networks. You know, Facebook, uh, Twitter accounts, um, you know, iGoogle, um, any, any, really any form of uh, electronic communication, um, including internet sites, would be covered by this policy. So what everybody has to keep in mind is that posted information becomes public information. So, you know, as representatives, you know, of the diocese, as teachers, principals, and staff, and other employees, you know, we cannot post inappropriate material or comments on our own or anybody else's websites. And along the same lines, if we happen to, you know, host our own Facebook page or website, uh, we are responsible for removing inappropriate material posted on our site by others. Because this information is all public. Another guideline is to associate only with appropriate social networking groups. Because um, if you affiliate with, um, you know, some group that um, you wouldn't want everybody out there, including, uh, you know, the kids in your school, the parents of the kids in your school, uh, to know about, then you shouldn't associate with that group because they will find out if you, if you associate with them. 
One of the big emphasis areas in these new guidelines is uh, social media and youth. This has come up um, quite a bit lately because there is a new Missouri law that's taking effect on August 28th uh, that has to do with this. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, this has been in the, in the uh, press quite a bit here recently. Under the diocesan guidelines, one-on-one -on -one or private electronic communication by employees or adult volunteers with minors is prohibited. And that sounds strong, and it is. Now, I'll get to it in a second. Parents can consent to it as long as they're included in the communications. But one-on-one -on -one or strictly private electronic communications by employees or adult volunteers with minors is prohibited. And that's not only for the protection of minors, it's for the protection of all of us as well. Parents and guardians must be copied on all electronic communications between diocesan representatives and minors. And that's what I mean when I say the guidelines prohibit one-on-one -on -one or private electronic communications. It's okay for a teacher to communicate to students via social networking as long as parents and guardians have access to those communications. Um, those communications must be limited to the types that are authorized by an executed parental consent form. And when this policy is uh, signed off by the bishop and made public, you'll see that there is a consent form that the parent will sign that says, I permit uh, the school to communicate with my child, you know, by these methods, um, you know, email communication, text message, um, institutional Facebook page, and for, by that I mean it might be a Facebook page that um, a coach has set up for his team that's publicly available to uh, all the members of the team and uh, all the parents of, and guardians of members of the team and does not allow private communications with any singular member of the team. Uh, but the parents have the right and the uh, option to give their consent to any or more of those types of communications. As I talked about, different forms of uh, communication that are covered by the consent form will be email, social networking sites, cell phones, text messages. And as I mentioned before, Missouri Senate Bill 54, which is the new Missouri law that goes into effect on August 28, basically, and this is for you know, every school district in uh, the state of Missouri, it requires them by January 1 of 2012 to adopt policies. That's really all that this new law requires. The new Missouri law, it requires school district to adopt policies concerning teacher-student communications. And it has, um, it sets forth different things that the policies must include, including certain prohibitions. And the one that's got the most notoriety in the press is that the policies must include a prohibition um, from, of a teacher from using a non-work-related site, which means like a personal Facebook page, uh, which allows exclusive access with a current or former student under age 18. So it's essentially what I talked about. It, it, the intent of that new law is to prohibit um, teachers from uh, exclusive, private, one-on-one uh, -on -one communications uh, with students or in the case of uh, former students uh, who are under 18 years old. The diocesan guidelines uh, are actually more strict than the new Missouri law and I think that they will be um, easier to follow because the, parent, the parental um, guidelines um, and consent form are going to be pretty clear cut as to what the parent is going to allow and not allow. Uh, again, it's going to impose another level of um, compliance uh, on the school uh, for making sure that, um, that, that uh, the teachers and the staff are abiding by 
um, those guidelines and consent forms, but it's something that we need to do to protect our kids and also to comply with this new Missouri law to some degree. So I got done in about 27 minutes. How about a round of applause for that? I knew that would uh, be appreciated. Um, again, I want to thank you. Um, Becky McGinnis and Jennifer Valenti and I are going to hang around up here in the corner uh, afterwards. If anybody wants to come up and just say hello or talk about uh, any of my presentation or any other diocesan policy or any other employment question you have, uh, the clock is not running right now. So, you know, be my guest and take advantage of this opportunity if you can. Please, hey, please be quiet. Dan's got something else to say, so. Please give his attention, your attention to Dan. Thank you. Thank you, John. Just a reminder to turn those slips into your principals. Make sure you get your slips to your principals. Uh, thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day and a good start of the year.